Hello, and welcome back. We're doing a dramatic reading of The Last Unicorn by Peter S. Beagle. We are on chapter 12, plots thickening, story reaching a pivotal peak. Let's keep going without delay into chapter 12, shall we? Thanks for sticking with me. In the great hall of King Haggard's castle, the clock struck six. Actually, it was 11 minutes past midnight, but the hall was a little darker than it had been at six o'clock or at noon. Yet those who lived in the castle told time by the difference in the dark. There were hours when the hall was cold simply for want of warmth and gloomy for lack of light, when the air was stale and still, and the stones stank of old water because there were no windows to let in the scouring wind. That was daytime. But at night, as some trees hold a living light all day, hold it with the undersides of their leaves until long after sundown, so at night the castle was charged and swarming with darkness, alive with darkness. Then the great hall was cold for a reason. Then the small sounds that slept by day woke up to patter and scratch in the corners. Powerful, powerful writing here. That's top of 226. It was night when the old smell of the stones seemed to rise from far below the floor. Light a light, Molly Grew said. Please, can you make a light? Smendrick muttered something curt and professional. For a moment, nothing happened. But then a strange, sallow brightness began to spread over the floor, scattering itself about the room in a thousand scurrying shards that shone and squeaked. The little night beasts of the castle were glowing like fireflies. They darted here and there in the hall, raising swift shadows with their sickly light and making the darkness even colder than before. "'I wish you hadn't done that,' Molly said. "'Can you turn them off again?' The purple ones, anyway, with the, with the legs, I guess. No, I can't, Smendrick answered crossly. Be quiet. Where's the skull? The Lady Amalthea could see it grinning from a pillar, lemon small in the shadows and dim as the morning moon, but she said nothing. She had not spoken since she came down from the tower. There, the magician said. He strode to the skull and peered into its split and crumbling eye sockets for a long time, nodding slowly and making solemn sounds to himself. Hmm. Hmm. Molly Grew stared with equal earnestness, but she glanced often at the Lady Amalthea. At last, Smendrick said, All right. Don't stand so close. Are there really spells to make a skull speak? Molly asked. The magician stretched out his fingers and gave her a small, competent smile. There are spells to make everything speak. The master wizards are, were great listeners, and they devised ways to charm all things of the world, living and dead, into talking to them. That is most of it, being a wizard, seeing, and listening. He drew a long breath, <sighs> suddenly looking away and rubbing his hands together. The rest is technique he said. Well, here we go. Abruptly, he turned to face the skull, put one hand lightly on the pale crown, and addressed it in a deep, commanding voice. The words marched out of his mouth like soldiers, their steps echoing with power as they crossed the dark air. But the skull made no answer at all. I just wondered, the magician said softly, he lifted his hand from the skull and spoke to it again. This time the sound of the spell was reasonable and cajoling, almost plaintive. The skull remained silent. But it seemed to Molly that a wakefulness slipped across the faceless front and was gone again. In the scuttling light of the radiant vermin, so it sounds like maybe uh, earlier, if you weren't following that, I had trouble in the beginning, that maybe Smendrick like, lit up some of the little creatures that were skittering about, like sprayed them with something almost magic somehow. So they're providing this sort of eerie light around them, kind of unique and original of a way to light a, a room. A Lady Amalthea's hair shone like a flower, appearing neither interested nor indifferent, but quiet in the way that a battlefield is sometimes quiet. 
She watched as Smendrick recited one incantation after another to a desert-colored knob of bone that spoke not one word more than she did. Each charm was uttered in a more despairing tone than the last, but the skull would not speak, and yet Molly Grew was certain that it was aware and listening and amused. She knew the silence of mockery too well to mistake it for death. The clock struck twenty-nine. At least it was at that point that Molly lost count. The rusty strokes were still clanking to the floor when Smendrick suddenly shook both fists at the skull and shouted, All right, all right for you, you pretentious kneecap. How would you like a punch in the eye? On the last words, his voice unraveled completely into a snarl of misery and rage. That's right, the skull said. Yell! Wake up, old Haggard! Its own voice sounded like branches creaking and knocking together in the wind. Yell louder, it said. The old man's probably around here somewhere. He doesn't sleep much. Molly gave a small cry of delight, and even the Lady Amalthea moved a step nearer. Smendrick stood with his fist shut and no triumph in his face. The skull said, Come on, ask me how to find the Red Bull. You can't go wrong asking my advice. I'm the king's watchman, set to guard the way to the bull. Even Prince Lear doesn't know the secret way, but I do. A little timidly, Molly Grew asked, If you are truly on guard here, why don't you give the alarm? Why don't you offer to help us instead of summoning the men-at-arms? The skull gave a rattling cackle. <laughs> I've been up this pillar a long time, it said. I was Haggard's chief henchman once, until he smote off my head for no reason. That was back in the days when he was being wicked to see if that was what he really liked to do. It wasn't. But he thought he might as well get some use out of my head. So he stuck it up here to serve as his sentinel. Under the circumstances, I'm not as loyal to King Haggard as I might be. <laughs> Svendrick spoke in a low voice. Answer the riddle, then. Tell us the way to the Red Bull. No, said the skull. Then it laughed like mad. <laughs> Why not? Molly cried furiously. What kind of game? The skull's long yellow jaws never moved, but it was some time before the mean laughter chattered to a halt. Even the scurrying night things paused for a moment, stranded in their candy light until it stopped. I'm dead, said the skull. I'm dead, and I'm hanging in the dark watching over Haggard's property. The only small amusement I have is to irk and exasperate the living, and I don't get much chance of that. It's a sad loss, because in life mine was a particularly exasperating nature. You'll pardon me, I'm sure, if I indulge myself with you a little. Try me tomorrow. Maybe I'll tell you tomorrow. But we have no time, Molly pleaded. Smendrick nudged her, but she rushed on, stepping close to the skull and appealing directly to its uninhabited eyes. We have no time. We may be too late now. I have time, the skull replied reflectively. It's really not so good to have time. Rush, scramble, desperation, this mist, that left behind, those others too big to fit in such a small space. That's the way life was meant to be. You are supposed to be too late for some things. Don't worry about it. Molly would have entreated further, but the magician gripped her arm and pulled her aside. Be still, he said in a swift, fierce voice. Not a word, not another word. The damn thing spoke, didn't it? Maybe that's all the riddle requires. It isn't, the skull informed him. I'll... Talk as much as you like, but I won't tell you anything. That's pretty rotten, isn't it? You should have seen me when I was alive. Smendrick paid no attention. 
Where's the wine? he demanded of Molly. Let me see what I can do with the wine. I couldn't find any, she said nervously. I looked everywhere. But I don't think I don't but I don't think there's a drop in the castle. The magician glared at her in vast silence. I looked, she said. Smendrick raised both arms slowly and let them fall to his sides. Well, he said, well, that's it then. If we can't find the wine, I have my illusions, but I can't make wine out of the air. The skull giggled in a clacking, talky way. (laughs) Matter can neither be created nor destroyed, it remarked. Not by most magicians, anyway. From a fold of her dress, Molly produced a small flask that gleamed faintly in the darkness. She said, I thought if you had some water to start with. Smendrick and the skull gave her very much the same look. Well, it's been done, she said loudly. It's not as you've had to make up something new. I'd never ask that of you. Now, maybe that's an allusion to the Bible, right? It's been done before, water being turned into wine. Uh, Page 231, by the way, of this version of the book, this reference is being made for those of you writing papers. Hearing herself, she looked sideways at the Lady Amalthea, but Smendrick took the flask from her hand and studied it thoughtfully, turning it over and murmuring curious, fragile words to himself. Finally, he said, why not? As you say, it's a standard trick. Standard trick. There was quite a vogue for it at one time, I remember, but it's really a bit dated these days. He moved one hand slowly over the flask, weaving a word into the air. "'What are you doing?' the skull asked eagerly. "'Hey, uh, do it closer. Do it over here. I can't see a thing.' The magician turned away, holding the flask to his breast and bowing over it. He began a whispery chant that made Molly think of the sounds that a dead fire continues to make long after the last coal is faded." You understand, he said, interrupting himself. It won't be anything special. Vin Odenaire, if that. Molly nodded solemnly. Smendrick said, and it's usually too sweet. And how I'm supposed to get it to drink itself, I haven't the faintest idea. Remember, that was part of the riddle when the wine drinks itself. He took up the incantation, excuse me, he took up the incantation again even more softly, while the skull complained bitterly that it couldn't see or hear anything. Molly said something quiet and hopeful to the Lady Amalthea, who neither looked at her nor replied. The chant stopped abruptly, and Smendrick raised the flask to his lips. He sniffed it at first, he sniffed at it first, muttering, Weak, weak, hardly any bouquet at all. Nobody ever made good wine by magic. Then he tilted it to drink, then shook it, and stared at it, and then, with a small, horrible smile, turned it over. Nothing ran out. Nothing at all. That's done it, Smendrick said, almost cheerfully. He touched a dry tongue to his dry lips and repeated, That's done it. That has finally done it. Still smiling, he lifted the flask again to hurl it across the hall. "'No, wait! Hey, don't!' the skull's clattering voice protested so wildly that Smendrick halted before the flask left his hand. Wow, that was kind of cool. Uh, page, top of two, page 30, 33, is that the author said he flung it. So even we, as the audience, are like, no, because I've seen the movie. I'm like, the, the scene can't go on if you shatter the, the, the flask, you know. But he hadn't. He hadn't left his hand. So he gave the skull and us as the audience the impression he had just thrown it. Before the flask left his hand, he and Molly turned together to regard the skull, which, so great was its anguish, had actually begun to wriggle where it hung, uh, crackling its weathered occiput hard against the pillar as it strove to free itself. Don't do that, it wailed. You people must be crazy throwing away wine like that. Give it to me if you don't want it, but don't throw it away. It rocked and lurched on the pillar, whimpering. A dreamy, wondering look crossed Smendrick's face, rather like a rain cloud drifting over dry country. Slowly, he asked, And what use have you for wine, with no tongue to taste it, no ribby palate to savor it, no gullet to gulp it down, fifty years dead? Can it be that you still remember, still desire? 
Fifty years dead, what else can I do? The skull had ceased its grotesque twitching, but frustration made its voice almost human. I remember, it said. I remember more than wine. Give me a swallow, that's all. Give me a sip, and I'll taste it as you never will. With all your runny flesh, all your buds and organs, I've had time to think. I know what wine is like. Give it to me. Smendrick shook his head, grinning, he said, eloquent, but I've been feeling a bit spiteful myself lately. For a third time, he lifted the empty flask, and the skull groaned in mortal misery. Out of pity, Molly Grew began to say, but it isn't, but the magician stepped on her foot. Of course, he mused aloud, if you should happen to remember the entrance to the Red Bull's cavern as well as you remember wine... We might bargain yet. He twiddled the flask casually between two fingers. Done, the skull cried instantly. Done for a dram. But give it to me now. I'm more thirsty with thinking of wine than I ever was in life. When I had a throat to be dry. Only give me a single swig now, and I'll tell you anything you want to know. The rusted jaws were beginning to grind sideways on each other. The skull's slaty teeth were trembling and splitting. "'Give it to him,' Molly whispered to Smendrick. She was terrified that the naked eye sockets might start to fill up with tears. But Smendrick shook his head again. "'I will give it all to you,' he said to the skull, "'after you tell us how we may find the bull.' The skull sighed. <sighs> but never hesitated. The way is through the clock, it said. You simply walk through the clock, and there you are. Now can I have the wine? Through the clock, the magician turned to peer into a far corner of the great hall where the clock stood. It was tall and black and thin, the sundown shadow of a clock. The glass over its face was broken, and the hour hand was gone. Behind gray glass, the works could barely be seen, twitching and turning as fretfully as fish. Smendrick said, You mean, when the clock strikes the right time, it opens and then there's a tunnel, a hidden stair? His voice was doubtful, for the clock seemed far too lean to conceal any such passageway. I don't know anything about that, the skull replied. If you wait for this clock to strike the hour, you'll be here till you're as bald as I am. Why complicate a little, se a simple secret? You walk through the clock, and the red bull is on the other side. Give me. But the cat said, Smedrick began. Then he turned and walked towards the clock. The darkness made him seem to be going away down a hill, growing th small and stooped. When he reached the clock, he kept walking without pause, as though it were truly no more than a shadow. But he bumped his nose. This is stupid, he said coldly to the skull as he returned. How do you think to cheat us? The way to the bull may well lead through the clock, but there's something more to know. Tell me, or I will spill the wine out on the floor for you to remember the smell and to look at, look, and the look of it as much as you choose. Be quick. But the skull was laughing again, this time making a thoughtful, almost kindly noise. <laughs> Remember what I told you about time, it said. When I was alive, I believed, as you do, that time was at least as real and solid as myself, and probably more so. I said one o'clock as though I could see it, and Monday as though I could find it on a map. And I let myself be hurried along from minute to minute, day to day, year to year, as though I, act I were actually moving from one place to another. Like everyone else, I lived in a house bricked up with seconds and minutes, weekends and New Year's days, and I never went outside until I died, because there was no other door. Now I know that I could have walked through the walls. Molly blinked bewilderedly, but, Shemps, but Smendrick was nodding. Yes, he said, that's how the real magicians do it. But then the clock, the clock will never strike the right time, the skull said. Haggard scrambled the works long ago. 
one day when he was trying to grab hold of time as it swung by. But the important thing is for you to understand that it doesn't matter whether the clock strikes ten or seven or fifteen o'clock. You can strike your own time and start the count anywhere. When you understand that, then any time at all will be the right time for you. At that moment, the clock struck four. The last bang had not yet faded when there came an answering sound from beneath the great hall. Neither a bellow nor the savage grumble that the Red Bull often made when he dreamed. It was a low, inquiring sound, as though the bull had awakened sensing something new in the night. Every flagstone buzzed like a snake, and the darkness itself seemed to shudder as the glowing night creature scampered wildly to the edges of the hall. Molly knew, suddenly and surely, that King Haggard was near. "'Give me the wine,' the skull said. "'I have kept my part of the bargain.' Silently, Smendrick tipped the empty flask to the empty mouth, and the skull gurgled and sighed and smacked. <laughs> ah, ah, it said at last. Ah, that was the real stuff. That was wine. You're more of a magician than I took you for. Do you understand me now? About time? Yes, Smendrick answered. I think so. The red bull made his curious sound again, and the skull rattled against the pillar. Smendrick said, No, I don't know. Is there no other way? How can there be? Molly heard footsteps, then nothing, then the thin, cautious ebb and flow of breathing. She could not tell where it came from. Smendrick turned to her, and his face seemed to be smudged from within, like the inside of a lantern glass, with fear and confusion. There was a light, too, but it shook like a lantern in a storm. "'I think I understand,' he said, "'but I'm sure I don't. I'll try.' "'I still think it's a real clock,' Molly said. "'That's all right, though.' "'I can walk through a real clock.' She spoke partly to comfort him, but she felt a brightness in her own body as she realized that what she had said was true. "'I don't know where we have to go,' she said, "'and that's as good as knowing the time any day.' The skull interrupted her. It said, "'I'll give you a bit of advice, a bit of advice in the bargain, because the wine was so good.' Smendrick looked guilty. The skull said, "'Smash me!' Just knock me to the floor and let me break in pieces. Don't ask why. Just do it. He was speaking very quickly, almost whispering. Together, Smendrick and Molly said, What? Why? The skull repeated its request. Smendrick demanded, What are you saying? Why on earth should we break you? Do it, the skull insisted. Do it. The sound of breath came nearer from all directions, though only on one pair of feet. No, Smendrick said. You're crazy. He turned his back and started a second time towards the gaunt, dark clock. Molly took the Lady Amalthea by her cold hand and followed him, trailing the white girl like a kite. All right, the skull said sadly. I warned you. In a terrible voice, a voice like hail on iron, it began at once to cry, Help! Ho! Oh, the king! Gods! To me! Here are burglars, bandits, moss troopers, kidnappers, housebreakers, murderers, characters, assassins, plagiarists, King Haggard! Ho! Oh, king Haggard! So I just have to jump in. That's cool because you never heard that in the uh, the movie itself. That the skull was almost trying to spare them, in this book anyways, from him turning into this sort of automatic charm. It sounds like he has some sort of uncontrollable reason, uh, charm to be an alarm. And he was trying to basically say, sacrifice me, destroy me, because otherwise I'm going to do that. That's what we just heard. Now over their heads and all around them, feet came clattering and they heard the whistling voices of the aged men at arms calling as they ran. No torches flared, for no light could be struck in the castle unless the king himself ordered it. And Haggard was yet silent. 
three thieves stood the three thieves stood confounded and undone gaping helplessly at the skull i'm sorry it said i'm just like that treacherous but i did try then its vanished eyes suddenly saw the lady amalfia and they went wide and bright although they could not move oh no it said softly no you don't i'm disloyal but i'm not that disloyal run smendrick said as he had said it long ago to the wild sea white legend that it had se- that he had just set free they fled across the great hall while the men-at-arms blundered loudly in the dark and the skull shrieked unicorn unicorn haggard haggard there she goes down to the red bull mind the clock haggard where are you unicorn unicorn then the king's voice rustled rustling savagely under the uproar fool traitor it was you who told her his quick secret footsteps sounded close by and smendrick set himself to turn and fight but there came a grunt and a, cr- and a crack and a scraping noise and then the bouncing crunch of an old of old bone on old stone the magician ran on then they stood before the clock there was little grace either for doubting or under there, yeah there was little grace either for doubting or understanding the men at arms were in the hall now and their clashing steps sent echoes booming back and forth between the walls while king haggard hissed and cursed them on the lady amalthea never hesitated she entered the clock and vanished as the moon passes between clouds hidden by them but not in them thousands of miles alone as though she were a dryad molly thought madly and time were her tree through the dim speckled glass molly could see the weights and the pendulum and the cankered chimes all swaying and burning as she stared there was no door beyond through which the lady amalfia might have gone there was only the rusty avenue of the works leading her eyes away into rain the weights drifted from side to side like seaweed king haggard was shouting stop them smash the clock Molly started to turn her head, meaning to tell Smendrick that she thought she knew what the skull had meant, but the magician had disappeared, and so had the great hall of King Haggard. The clock was gone, too. She was standing beside the Lady Amalfia in a cold place. The king's voice came to her from very far away, not so much heard as remembered. She went on turning her head and found herself looking into the face of Prince Lear. Behind them there fell a bright mist, shivering like the sides of a fish, and bearing no resemblance at all to corroded clockwork. Smendrick was nowhere to be seen. Prince Lear bent his head gravely to Molly, but it was to the Lady Amalfia that he spoke first. "'And you would have gone on without me,' he said. "'You haven't been listening at all.' She answered him then, when she had not spoken to Molly or the magician. In a low, clear voice she said, I would have come back. I do not know why I am here, or who I am, but I would have come back. No, said the prince, you would never have come back. Before he could say anything more, Molly broke in, much to her own surprise, crying, Never mind all that. Where's Smendrick? The two strangers looked at her in courteous wonder that anyone else in the world should be able to speak, and she felt herself shake once from head to heels. Where is he? she demanded. I'll go back myself if you won't. She turned round again. He came out of the mist, walking with his head down as though he were leaning against a strong wind. He was holding a hand to his temple, and when he took it away, the blood came softly down. It's all right, he said, when he saw that the blood was falling on Molly Grew's hands. It's all right. It's not deep. I couldn't get through until it happened. He bowed shakily to Prince Lear. I thought it was you who went by me. I thought it was you who went by me in the dark, he said. Tell me, how did you pass through the clock so easily? The skull said you didn't know the way. The prince looked puzzled. What way? he asked. What was there to know? I saw where she had gone, and I followed. Smendrick's sudden laugh rubbed itself raw against the snaggy walls that came swimming in on them as their eyes grew familiar with this new darkness. Of course, some things have their own time by nature he not he he laughed again shaking his head and the blood flew 
Molly tore a piece out of her dress. Those poor old men, the magician said. They didn't want to hurt me, and I wouldn't have hurt them if I could. We dodged around and around, apologizing to each other, and Haggard was yelling, and I kept bumping into the clock. I knew that it wasn't a real clock, but it felt real, and I worried about it. Then Haggard came up with a sword and hit me. He closed his eyes as Molly bound his head. Haggard, he said. I was getting to like him. I still do. He looked so frightened. The dim, removed voices of the king and his men seemed to grow louder. I don't understand, Prince Lear said. Why was he frightened? My father. Did he... What did he... But just then, from the far side of the clock, they heard a wordless squall of triumph and the beginning of a great crash. (laughs) The shimmering haze vanished immediately, and a black silence caved in on them all. Haggard has destroyed the clock, Smendrick said presently. Now there is no way back and no way out but the bull's way. A slow, thick wind began to wake. And that is the end of chapter 12, folks, but I'm inclined to barrel ahead into chapter 13. So um, thanks for reading and sticking with me and for your patience as I got these out. Uh, been a busy, busy season in my life, but let us continue now on chapter 13. The way was wide enough for all of them to walk abreast, but they went one by one. The Lady Amalthea walked in front by her own choosing. Prince Lear, Smendrick, and Molly Grew following had only her hair for lantern, but she herself had no light before her at all. She went on as easily as though she had been this way before. Where they truly were, they never knew. The cold wind seemed real, as did the cold reek that rode it, and the darkness let them pass far more grudgingly than had the clock. The path itself was enough of a fact to bruise feet and to be partly choked in places by real stones and real earth that had crumbled down the sides of the cave. But its course was the impossible way of a dream, pitched and skewed, rounding on itself, now dropping almost sheer, now seeming to rise a little, now working out and slowly down, now wandering back to take them perhaps once again below the great hall where old King Haggard must still be raging over a toppled clock, and a shiv- and a sh- uh, yeah a shivered skull witch work surely smendrick thought and nothing made by a witch is real at the last then he added but this must be the last it will all be real enough if this is not the last as they stumbled along he hardly told prince lear the tale of their adventures beginning with his own strange history and stranger doom recounting the ruin of the midnight carnival and his flight with the unicorn and continuing through their meeting with molly grew the journey to hagsgate and drin's story of the double curse on the town and the tower there he halted for beyond lay the night of the red bull a night that ended for good or ill with magic and with a naked girl who struggled in her body like a cow in quicksand He hoped that the prince would be more interested in learning of his heroic birth than in the origins of the Lady Amalfia. Prince Lear marveled suspiciously, which is an awkward thing to manage. "'I've known for a very long time that the king is not my father,' he said. "'But I tried hard to be his son all the same. "'I'm the enemy of any any who plot against him, "'and it would take more than a crone's gibbering to make me work his downfall.' As for the other, I think there are no unicorns any more, and I know that King Haggard has never seen one. How could any man who looked upon a unicorn even once, let alone thousands with every tide, possibly be as sad as King Haggard is? Why, if I had seen her once and never again, he now he himself paused in some confusion, for he also felt that the talk was going on to some sorrow from which it could never be called back. Molly's neck and shoulders were listening intently, but if the Lady Amalthea could hear what the two of them were saying, she gave no sign. "'Yet the king has a joy hidden somewhere about his life,' Smendrick pointed out. "'Have you never seen a trace of it, truly? Even seen its track in his eyes? I have. Think for a moment, Prince Lear.' The prince was silent. 
and they wound further into the foul dark. They could not always tell whether they were climbing or descending, nor, sometimes, if the passage were bending once again, until the gnarly nearness of, the st of stone at their shoulders suddenly became the bleak rake of a wall against their faces. There was not the smallest sound of the red bull, or any glimmer of the wicked light. But when Smendrick touched his damp face, the smell of the bull came off on his fingers. Prince Lear said, Sometimes, when he has been on the tower, there is something in his face. Not a light exactly, but a clearness. I remember. I was little, and he never looked like that when he looked at me, or anything else. And I had a dream. He was walking very slowly now, scuffing his feet. I used to have a dream, he said. At the same, the same dream, over and over, about standing at my window in the middle of the night and seeing the bull, seeing the red bull, he did not finish, seeing the bull driving unicorns into the sea, Smendrick said. It was no dream. Haggard has them all now, drifting in and out of the tides for his delight. All but one. The magician drew a deep breath. That one is the Lady Amalthea. Yes, Prince Lear answered him. Yes, I know. Smendrick stared at him. What do you mean you know? He demanded angrily. How could you possibly know that the Lady Amalthea is a unicorn? She can't have told you, because she doesn't remember it herself. Since you took her fancy, she has thought only of being a mortal woman. He knew quite well that the truth was the other way around, but it made no difference to him just then. How do you know? He asked him again. Prince Lear stopped walking and turned to face him. It was too dark for Smendrick to see anything but the cool, milky shining where his wide eyes were. I did not know what she was until now, he said, but I knew the first time I saw her that she was something more than I could see. Unicorn, mermaid, lamia, sorceress, gorgon. No name you give her would surprise me or frighten me. I love whom I love. Nice sentiment. <laughs> That's a very nice sentiment, Smendrick said. But when I, chart, when I change her back into her true self so that she may do battle with the Red Bull and free her people, I love whom I love, Prince Lear repeated firmly. You have no power over anything that matters. Before the magician could reply, the Lady Amalthea was standing between them, though neither man had seen or heard her as she came back through, along the passageway. In the darkness, she gleamed and trembled like running water. She said, I will go no further. It was to the prince that she spoke, but it was Smendrick who said, There is no choice. We can only go on. Molly Grew came nearer, one anxious eye on the pale start of a cheekbone. The magician said again, We can only go on. The Lady Amalthea would not look straight at him. He must not change me, he said. To, she, she said to Prince Lear. Do not let him work his magic on me. The bull has no care for human beings. We may only walk past, walk out past him and get away. It is a unicorn the bull wants. Tell him not to change me into a unicorn. Prince Lear twisted his fingers until they cracked. Smendrick said, It is true. We might very well escape the red bull that way even now, as we escaped before. But if we do, there will never be another chance. All the unicorns of the world will remain his prisoners forever, except one and she will die. She will grow old and die. Everything dies, she said, still to Prince Lear. It is good that everything dies. I want to die when you die. Do not let him enchant me. Do not let him make me immortal. I am no unicorn, no magical creature. I am human, and I love you. He answered her, saying gently, I don't know much about enchantments, except how to break them. But I know that even the very greatest wizards are powerless against two who keep to each other. And this one is only poor Smendrick, after all. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of anything. Whatever you have been, you are mine now. I can hold you. She turned to look at the magician at last, and even through the darkness he could feel the terror in her eyes. No, she said. No, we are not strong enough. He will change me. And whatever happens after that... You and I will lose each other, and I will not love you when I am a unicorn, and you will love me only because you cannot help it. 
I will be more beautiful than anything in the world and live forever. Smendrick began to speak, but the sound of his voice made her cower like a candle flame. I will not have it. I will not have it be so. I will not have it so. He was looking back and forth from the prince. She was looking back and forth from the prince to the magician, holding her voice together like the edges of a wound. She said, If there is a single moment of love when he changes me, you will know it, for I will let the red bull drive me into the sea with the others. Then at least I will be near you. There's no need for all that, Smendrick spoke, spoke lightly, making himself laugh. I doubt I could turn you back if you wished it. Nikos himself never could turn a human being into a unicorn, and you are truly human now. You can love and fear and forbid things to be what they are and overact. Let it end here, then. Let the quest end. Is this the world? Is the world any worse for losing the unicorns? Or would it be any better if they were running free again? One good woman more in the world is worth every single unicorn gone. Let it end. Marry the prince and live happily ever after. Powerful statements here. This is page 250 in this book. The passageway seemed to be glowing, growing lighter, and Smendrick imagined the red bull stealing towards them, grotesquely cautious, setting his hooves down as, prim as primly as a heron. The thin glimmer of Molly Grew's cheekbone went out as she turned her face away. Yes, said the Lady Amalthea, that is my wish. But at that moment, Prince Lear said, no. The word escaped him as suddenly as a sneeze, emerging in a questioning squeak, the voice of a silly young man, mortally embarrassed by a rich and terrible gift. No, he repeated, and this time the word told in another voice, a king's voice, not haggard, but a king whose grief was not for what he did not have, but for what he could not give. My lady, he said, I am a hero. It is a trade. No more like weaving or brewing, and like them it has its own tricks and knacks and small arts. There are ways of perceiving witches, of knowing poison streams, and there are certain and uh, there are certain weak spots that all dragons have, and certain riddles that hooded strangers tend to set you. But the true secret of being a hero lies in knowing the order of things. The swineherd cannot already be wed to the princess when he embarks on his adventures, nor can the boy knock at the witch's door when she's away on vacation. The wicked uncle cannot be found out and foiled before he does something wicked. Things must happen when it is time for them to happen. Quests may not simply be abandoned. Prophecies may not be left to rot like unpicked fruit. Unicorns may go unrescued for a long time, but not forever. The happy ending cannot come in the middle of the story. The Lady Amalthea did not answer him. Smendrick asked, Why not? Who says so? Heroes, Prince Lear replied sadly. Heroes know about order, about happy endings. Hero knows, heroes know that some things are better than others. Carpenters know grains and shingles and straight lines. He puts his hand out. He put his hands out to the Lady Amalthea and took one step toward her. She did not draw back from him, nor turn her face. Indeed, she lifted her head higher, and it was the prince who looked away. "'You were the one who taught me,' he said. "'I never looked at you without seeing the sweetness of the way the world goes together, or without sorrow for its spoiling. I became a hero to serve you, and all that is like you. Also to find some way of starting a conversation.' But the Lady Amalthea spoke no word to him. Pale as lime, the brightness was rising in the cavern. They could see one another clearly now, each gone, a tallowy and gone tallowy and strange with fear. Even the beauty of the Lady Amalthea drained away under that dull, hungry light. She looked more mortal than any, other three, any of the other three. "'The bull is coming,' Prince Lear said. He turned and set off down the passageway, taking the bold, eager strides of a hero. Then Lady Amalthea followed him walking as lightly and proudly as princesses are taught to try to walk. Molly Grew stayed close to the magician, taking his hands as she had used to touch the unicorn when she was lonely. He smiled down at her, looking quite pleased with himself. Molly said, Let her stay the way she is. Let her be. Tell that to Lear, he replied cheerfully. Was it I who said that order is all? 
Was it I who said she must challenge the Red Bull because it will be more proper and precise that way? I have no concern for regulated rescues and official happy endings. That's Lear. But you made him do it, she said. You knew that all he wants in the world is to give her to give up her quest and stay is oh, all he wants in the world is to have her give up her quest and stay with him. And she would have done it, but you reminded him that he is a hero, and now he has to do what heroes do. He loves her, and you tricked him. I never, Smendrick said. Be quiet. He'll hear you. Molly felt herself growing lightheaded, silly with the nearness of the bull. The light and the smell had become a sticky sea in which she floundered like the unicorns, hopeless and eternal. The path was beginning to tilt downward into the deepening night light, and far ahead Prince Lear and the Lady Amalthea went marching along to disaster as calmly as candles burning down. Molly grew snickered. She went on, I knew why you did it too. You can't become mortal yourself until you change her back again. Isn't that it? You don't care what happens to her, or to the others, as long as you become a real magician at last. Isn't that it? Well, you'll never be a real magician, even if you change the bull into a bullfrog, because it's still just a trick when you do it. You don't care about anything but magic, and what kind of magician is that? Smendrick, I don't feel good. I have to sit down. Smendrick must have carried her for a time, because she was definitely not walking, and his green eyes were ringing in her head. That's right. Nothing but magic matters to me. I would round up unicorns for Haggard myself if it would heighten my power by half a hair. It's true. I have no preferences and no loyalties. I have only magic. His voice was hard and sad. Really? she asked, rocking dreamily in her terror, watching the brightness flowing by. That's awful. She was very impressed. Are you really like that? No he said, and then later, No, it's not true. How could I be like that and still have all these troubles? Then he said, Molly, you have to walk now. He's here. Oh, he's there. He's there. Molly saw the horns first. The light made her cover her face, but the pale horns struck bitterly through hands and eyelids to the back of her mind. She saw Prince Lear and the Lady Amalthea standing before the horns, and while the fire flourished on the walls of the cavern and soared up into the roofless dark, Prince Lear had drawn his sword, but it blazed up in his hand, and he let it fall, and it broke like ice. The Red Bull stamped his foot, and everyone fell down. Smendrick had thought to find the bull waiting in his lair or in some wild place with room enough to do battle, but he had come silently up the passageway to meet them, and now he stood across their sight, not only from one burning wall to the other, but somehow in the walls themselves and beyond them, bending away forever. Yet he was no mirage, but the red bull, still steaming and snuffling, shaking his blind head. His jaws champed over his breath with a terrible wallowing sound. Now... Now is the time, whether I work ruin or great good, this is the end of it. The magician rose slowly to his feet, ignoring the bull, listening only to his cupped self as to a seashell. But no power stirred or spoke in him. He could hear nothing but the far, thin howling of emptiness against his ear, as old King Haggard must have heard it waking and sleeping, and never another sound. It will not come to me. Nikos was wrong. I am what I seem. The Lady Amalthea had stepped back a pace from the bull, but no more, and she was regarding him quietly as he pawed with his front feet and snorted great, rumbling, rainy blasts out of his vast nostrils. He seemed puzzled about her and almost foolish. He did not roar. The Lady Amalthea stood in his freezing light with her head tipped back to see all of them. Without turning her head, she put her hand out to find Prince Lear's hand. Good. Good. There's nothing I can do, and I'm glad of it. The bull will let her by, and she will go away with Lear. It, uh, it is as right as anything. I'm only sorry about the unicorns. That's in his thoughts in italics. The prince had not yet noticed her offered hand, but in a moment... 
he would turn and see and touch her for the first time. He will never know what she has given him, but neither will she. The bull lowered his head and charged. He came without warning, with no sound but the rip of his hooves, and if he had chosen, he could have crushed all four of them in that one silent onslaught. But he let them scatter before him and flatten themselves into the wrinkled walls, and he went by without harming them, though he might easily have horned them out of the shallow shelters like so many periwinkles. Supple as fire, he turned where there was no room to turn and met them, his muzzle almost touching the ground his neck swelling like a wave. It was then that he roared. They fled, and he followed, not as swiftly as he had charged, but quickly enough to keep each one alone, friendless in the wild dark. Oh, holy moly, Peter S. Beagle, your writing is killer in this chapter. The ground tore under their feet, and they cried out, but they could not even hear themselves. Every bellow of the red bull brought great slides of stones and earth shuddering down on them, and still they scrambled along like broken insects, and still he came after them. Through his mad blaring they heard another sound the deep whine of the castle itself as it strained at its roots, drumming like a flag in the wind of his wrath. And very faintly there drifted up the passageway the smell of the sea. He knows, he knows. I fooled him once that way, but not again. Woman or unicorn, he will hunt her into the sea this time, as he was bidden, and no magic of mine will turn him from it. Haggard has won. So the magician thought as he ran, all hope gone for the first time in his long, strange life. The way widened suddenly, and they emerged into a kind of grotto that could only have been the bull's den. The stench of his sleeping hulk so thick and old here that it had a loathly loathly sweetness about it, and the cave brooded gullet red, as though his light had rubbed off on the walls and crusted in the cracks and crevices. Beyond lay the tunnel again, and the dim gleam of breaking water. The Lady Amalthea fell as, irrev- fell as irrevocably as a flower breaks. Smendrick leapt to one side, wheeling to drag Molly Grew with him. They brought up hard against a split slab of rock, and there they crouched together as the red bull raged by without turning. But he came to a halt between one stride and the next, and the sudden stillness, broken only by the bull's breathing and the distant grinding of the sea, would have been absurd but for the cause of it. She lay on her side, with one leg bent beneath her. She moved slowly, but she made no sound. Prince Lear stood between her body and the bull, weaponless, but his hands up as though they still held a sword and shield. Once more in the endless night, the prince said, No! He looked very foolish, and he was about to be trampled flat. The red bull could not see him, and would kill him without ever knowing that he had been in the way. Wonder and love and great sorrow shook Smendrick the magician then, and came together inside him, and filled him, filled him until he felt himself brimming and flowing with something that was none of these. He did not believe it, but it came to him anyway, and as it had touched him twice before, and left him more barren than he had been. This time, there was too much of it for him to hold. It spilled through his skin, sprang from his fingers and toes, welled up equally in his eyes and his hair and the hollows of his shoulders. There was too much to hold, too much ever to use, and still he found himself weeping with the pain of his impossible greed. He thought or said or sang, I did not know that I was so empty to be so full. The Lady Amalthea lay where she had fallen, though now she was trying to rise, and Prince Lear still guarded her, raised his naked hands against the enormous shape that loomed over him. The tip of the prince's tongue stuck out of one corner of his mouth, making him look as serious as a child taking something apart. Long years later, when Smendrick's name had become a greater name than Nikos's, and worse than than Efreet surrendered, and worse than Efreet than Afrit surrendered at the sound of it, he was never able to work the smallest magic without seeing Prince Lear before him. His eyes squinted up because of the brightness, and his tongue sticking out. 
The red bull stamped again, and Prince Lear fell on his face and got up, bleeding. The bull's rumble began, and the blind, bloated head started down, lowering like one half of the scales of doom. Lear's valiant heart hung between the pale horns, as good as dripping from their tips. Himself as good as smashed and scattered, and his mouth buckled a little, but he never moved. The sound of the bull grew louder as the horns went down. Then Smendrick stepped into the open and said a few words. They were short words, undistinguished either by melody or harshness, and Smendrick himself could not hear them for the red bull's dreadful bawling, but he knew what they meant, and he knew exactly how to say them, and he knew that he could say them again when he wanted to, in the same way or in a different way. Now he spoke them gently and with joy, and as he did so, he felt his immortality fall from him like armor, or like a shroud. At the first word of the spell, the Lady Amalthea gave a thin, bitter cry. Then she reached out again to Prince Lear, but he had his back to her, protecting her, and he did not hear. Molly grew, heartsick, caught at Smendrick's arm, but the magician spoke on. Yet even when the wonder blossomed where she had been, sea white, sea white, as boundlessly beautiful as the bull, bull was mighty, as boundlessly beautiful as the bull was mighty. Ooh, still the Lady Amalthea clung to herself for a moment more. She was no longer there, and yet her face hovered like a breath in the cold, reeky light. It would have been better if Prince Lear had not turned until she was gone, but he turned. He saw the unicorn, and she shone in him as in a glass, but it was to the other that he called, to the castaway, to the Lady Amalthea. His voice was the end of her. She vanished when he cried her name, as though he had crowned, as though he had crowed for day. Let's do that sentence again. His voice was the end of her. She vanished when he cried her name, as though he had crowed for day. Things happen both swiftly and slowly, as they do in dreams, where it is really the same thing. The unicorn stood very still, looking at them, all out of lost, every elsewhere eyes. She seemed even more beautiful than Smendrick remembered, for no one can keep a unicorn in his head for long, and yet she was not as she had been, no more than he was. Molly Grew started toward her, speaking softly and foolishly, but the unicorn gave no sign that she knew her. The marvelous horn remained dull as rain. With a roar that set the walls of his lair belling out and crackling like circus canvas, the red bull charged for the second time. The unicorn fled across the cave and into darkness. Prince Lear, in turning, had stepped a little to one side, and before he could wheel back again, the bull's plunging pursuit smashed him down, stunned with his mouth open. Molly would have gone to him, but Smendrick took hold of her and dragged her along after the bull and the unicorn. Neither beast was in sight, but the tunnel still thundered from their desperate passage. Dazed and bewildered, Molly stumbled beside the fierce stranger who would neither let her fall nor slacken her pace. Over her head and all around, she could feel the castle groaning, creaking in the rock like a loosening tooth. The witch's rhyme jangled in her memory over and over again. Yet none but one of Hagsgate Town may bring the castle swirling down. Suddenly it was sand slowing their feet, and the smell of the sea, cold as the other smell, but so good, so friendly, that they both stopped running and laughed aloud. Above them, on the cliff, King Haggard's castle splayed up toward a gray-green morning sky, splashed with thin, milky clouds. Molly was sure that the king himself must be watching from one of the tremulous towers, but she could not see him. A few stars still fluttered in the heavy blue sky over the water. The tide was out, and the bald beach had the gray, wet gleam of a stripped shellfish. But far down the strand the sea was bending like a bow, and Molly knew that the ebb had ended. 
The unicorn and the red bull stood facing each other at the arch of the bow, and the unicorn's back was to the sea. The bull moved in slowly, not charging, but pressing her almost gently toward the water, never touching her. She did not resist him. Her horn was dark, her head was down, and the bull was as much her master as he had been on the plain of Hagsgate before she became the Lady Amalthea. It might have been the same hopeless dawn, except for the sea. Yet she was not altogether beaten. She backed away until one hind foot actually stepped into the water. At that, she sprang through the sullen smolder of the red bull and ran away along the beach, so swift and light that the wind of her passing blew her footprints off the sand. The bull went after her. "'Do something!' A hoarse voice said to Smendrick, as Molly had said it long ago. Prince Lear stood behind him, his face bloody and his eyes mad. He looked like King Haggard. "'Do something,' he said. "'You have the power. You changed her into a unicorn. Do something now to save her. I will kill you if you don't.' He showed the magicians his hands. "'I cannot,' Smendrick answered him quietly. "'Not all the magic in the world can help her now. If she will not fight him, she must go into the sea with the others.' Neither magic nor murder will help her. Molly heard small waves slapping on the sand. The tide was beginning to turn. She saw no unicorns tumbling in the water, though she looked for them, willing them to be there. What if it is too late? What if they drifted out on the last ebb tide, out to the deepest sea where no ships go, because of the kraken and the sea drake, and because of the floating jungles of rack that tangle and drown even these? She will never find them. Would she stay with me? Then what is magic for? Prince Lear demanded wildly. What use is wizardry if it cannot save a unicorn? He gripped the magician's shoulder hard to keep from falling. Smendrick did not turn his head. With a touch of sad mockery in his voice, he said, That's what heroes are for. They could not see the unicorn for the hugeness of the bull, but suddenly she doubled her track and came flying up the beach toward them. Blind and patient as the sea, the red bull followed her, his hooves gouging great ditches in the damp sand. Smoke and fire and spray and storm, they came on together, neither one gaining, and Prince Lear gave a soft grunt of understanding. Yes, of course, he said. That is exactly what heroes are for. Wizards make no difference, so they say that nothing does. But heroes are meant to die for unicorns. He let go of Smendrick's shoulder, smiling to himself. There is a basic fallacy in your reasoning, Smendrick began indignantly, but the prince never heard what it was. The unicorn flashed by them, her breath streaming blue-white and her head carried too high, and Prince Lear leapt into the path of the red bull. For a moment he disappeared entirely, like a feather in a flame. The bull ran over him and left him lying on the ground. One side of his face cuddled too hard into the sand, and one leg kicked the air three times before it stopped. He fell without a cry, and Smendrick and Molly alike were stricken as silent as he, but the unicorn turned. The red bull halted when she did, and wheeled to put her once more between himself and the sea. He began his mincing, dancing advance again, but he might have been a courting bird for all the attention the unicorn paid him. He stood motionless, staring at the twisted body. She stood motionless, staring at the twisted body of Prince Lear. The tide was grumbling in hard now, and the beach was already a slice narrower. Whitecaps and Skipper's daughters spilled up into the sprawling dawn, but Molly Grew still saw no other unicorn but her own. Over the castle, the sky was scarlet, and on the highest tower, King Haggard stood up as clear and black as a winter tree. Molly could see the straight scar of his mouth and his nails darkening as he gripped the parapet. But the castle cannot fall now. Only Lear could have made it fall. Suddenly the unicorn screamed. Ree! It was not at all like the challenging bell which went, which she had first met the bull. It was an ugly, squawking wail of sorrow and loss and rage, such as no immortal creature ever gave. The castle quaked and King Haggard shrank back with one arm across his face. The Red Bull hesitated, shuffling in the sand, lowing doubtfully. The unicorn cried out again and reared up like a scimitar. 
The, the scimitar is a curved blade. The sweet sweep of her body made Molly close her eyes, but she opened them again in time to see the unicorn leap at the red bull and the bull swerve out of her way. The unicorn's horn was light again, burning and shivering like a butterfly. Ooh, call back to the butterfly at the beginning of the, of the uh, book, I believe. Again, she charged, and again the bull gave ground, heavy with perplexity, but still quite quick as a fish. His own horns were the color and likeness of lightning, and the slightest swing of his head made her stagger. But he retreated and retreated, backing steadily down the beach as she had done. She lunged after him, driving to kill but she could not reach him. She might have been stabbing at a shadow or at a memory. So the red bull fell back without giving battle until she had stalked him to the water's edge. There he made his stand, with the surf swirling about his hooves and the sand rushing away under them. He would neither fight nor fly, and she knew now that she could never destroy him. Still, she set herself for another charge while he muttered wonderingly in his throat. For Molly grew, the world hung motionless in that glass moment. As though she were standing on a higher tower than King Haggard's, she looked down on a pale pairing of land where a toy man and woman stared with their knitted eyes at a clay bull and a tiny ivory unicorn, abandoned playthings. There was another doll, too, half buried, and a sand castle with a stick king propped up in one turret. Oh, sorry, my, my computer almost went uh, to sleep there. The tide would take it all in a moment, and nothing would be left but the flaccid, flaccid birds of the beach hopping in circles. Then Smendrick shook her back to his side, saying, Molly, far out to sea, the combers were coming in, the long, heavy rollers curling over white across their green hearts, tearing themselves to smoke on the sandbars and the slimy rocks, rasping up the beach with a sound like fire. The birds flew up in yelling clumps, their strident outrage lost in the cry of waves like pins. And in the whiteness, of the whiteness, flowering in the tattered water, their bodies arching with the streaked marble hollows of the waves, their manes and tails and the fragile beards of the males burning in the sunlight, their eyes as dark and jeweled as the deep sea, and the shining of the horns, the seashell shining of the horns. The horns came riding in like the rainbow masts of silver ships. But they would not come to land while the bull was there. They rolled in the shallows, swirling together, together as madly as frightened fish where the nets were be when the nets were being hauled up, no longer with the sea, but not losing it. Hundreds were borne in with each swell and hurled against the ones already struggling to keep from being shoved ashore, and they in their turn struck out desperately, rearing and stumbling, stretching their long, cloudy necks far back. The unicorn lowered her head one last time and hurled herself at the red bull. If he had been either true flesh or a windy ghost, the blow would have burst him like rotten fruit. But he turned away unnoticing and walked slowly into the sea. The unicorns in the water floundered wildly to let him by, stamping and slashing the surf into a royal mist which their horns turned rainbow. But on the beach and atop the cliff and up and down through all of Hagard's kingdom, the land sighed when his weight had passed from it. He strode out a long way before he began to swim. The hugest waves broke no higher than his hawks, and the timid tide ran away from him. But when at last he let himself sink into the flood, then a great surge of the sea stood up behind him, a green and black swell as deep and smooth and hard as the wind. It gathered in silence, folding from one horizon to the other, until, for a moment, it actually hid the Red Bull's humped shoulders and sloping back. Smendrick lifted the dead prince, and he and Molly ran until the cliff face stopped them. The wave fell like a cloudburst of chains. Then the unicorns came out of the sea. Molly never saw them clearly. They were a light leaping toward her and a cry that dazzled her eyes. She was wise enough to know that no mortal was ever meant to see all the unicorns in the world, and she tried to find her own unicorn and look only at her. 
there were too many of them. They were too beautiful. Blind as the bull, she moved to meet them, holding out her arms. The unicorns would surely have run her down as the red bull had trampled Prince Lear, for they were mad, for with freedom. But Smendrick spoke, and they streamed to the right and left of Molly and Lear and himself, some even springing over them, as the sea shatters on a rock and then comes whirling together again. All around Molly there flowed and flowered a light as impossible as snow set afire, while thousands of cloven hoods, hooves sang like sang by like cymbals. She stood very still, neither weeping nor laughing, for her joy was too great for her body to understand. Page 269. Look up, Smendrick said. The castle is falling. She turned and saw that the towers were melting as the unicorns sprang up the cliff and flowed around them, exactly as though they had been made out of the sand and the sea. Oh, exactly as though they had been made out of sand and the sea were sliding in. The castle came down in great cold chunks uh, that turned thin and waxen as they swirled in the air until they disappeared. It crumbled and vanished without a sound, and it left no ruins, either on land or in the memories of the two who watched it fall. A minute later, they could not remember where it had stood or how it had looked. But King Haggard, who was quite real, fell down through the wreckage of his disenchanted castle like a knife dropped through the clouds. Molly heard him laugh once, as though he had expected it. Very little ever surprised King Haggard. That is the end of chapter 13, folks. One of the longest sessions I've done for this book so far. Probably top of one of the longest sessions I've done for the channel. But you folks have been patient and as I you know, had some other priorities and stuff like that I had to tend to. This is a labor of love. I record these primarily for my kids so that if I'm just not around for any reason, they could always have me read some of my favorite classics to them, but also for your kids and for the young at heart. So I hope you've been enjoying it. We really have just one session left, the sort of epilogue and the ending. So hopefully you're already a subscriber, supporter. Let me know what you think. It's an honor to be able to read and share some great um, books with you. And a big shout out to Peter S. Beagle, the author who really brought it on those last couple chapters, right? Love the metaphors and stuff like that that he used. Um, more to come as we close this out on the next session. See you on the next one.